Okay, in this example, we've got a lens represented by this vertical bar here. Uh, it tells us what the focal points are, and it also gives us the location and height of an object. And you know what's meant by these uh, inwards curves on the end caps of the lens here? Um, wait, could you repeat that? What's meant by these, uh, uh, this curve here and this curve here? Have you seen that notation? I've only seen it like once in lecture, but I don't really remember what it means. These curves are specifically referring to what type of lens it is. And typically the inward curve represents that this is a converging lens. Whereas if we were looking at, I think on the next page, yeah, these outwards curves represent a, a diverging lens. And that's typically, whether it's converging or diverging in terms of the actual physical object is determined by the shape, whether it's convex or concave and also the material it's made of as, compo as compared to the surrounding material. Uh, the main idea of a converging lens though, which is typically a lens that is shaped uh, convex, like bulging outwards instead of bulging inwards. Let's say we have a lens of that shape. Like this. And let's say we've got some incoming rays of light. Uh, specifically, let's say we've got a ray of light that starts off par uh, parallel, or let's say just going through the central axis. If we have a ray of light that is passing along this line, we call the central axis, what would you expect to happen to that ray of light when it hits the surface of, let's say, the glass? Would it get reflected back horizontally? Some of the light gets reflected back horizontally, but for a lens, we don't really care about the, the bounce back. We care about what gets through. So what would you expect to happen to the portion of the ray of light that does get through? Um, it would still be along the center line. Yeah, because this is coming in perpendicular to the surface. Any ray of light that comes in perpendicular to the surface doesn't change at all. It's just going to go straight through. And it's still perpendicular to this surface, so it keeps going. No change. What does the near F denote? Uh, those are called the focal points of the lens. And where that comes in is what happens if you have another ray of light. Let's say you've got another ray that's coming in parallel to the central axis, but higher up. That's no longer hitting the surface perpendicular. Uh, so what would you expect to happen to this ray of light if it's not perpendicular to the surface? Uh, it would reflect through the focal point. Yeah, or I would say refract. Reflecting means bouncing back. Refracting means going through. And if you're not sure which way it's going to go in terms of the refraction, you can always find out by drawing in a normal line that is a line that is perpendicular to the surface itself. Uh, I guess that would be a little more like this. If we draw in a line perpendicular to the surface at that point where the, where the ray of light hits it, that ray of light makes an angle with the, the incoming ray of light makes a certain angle with the normal line. The ray of light as it continues through, if it just continued straight through, it would make the same angle with the normal line on the other side. But we shouldn't expect the same angle. Have you seen the idea of Snell's law yet? Yeah. If you've got a change in material, we're going from air, which allows light to travel fast, to glass, which makes light travel slower. So we're slowing down the light. What would you expect to happen to the angle? Um, it would decrease. Wait, yeah. no, it would increase if we're slowing down. Uh, in this case, it would decrease. In general, I mean, I've seen a lot of different ways to set up uh, how to remember this. What finally worked for me is if the speed slows down, if the speed decreases, then the angle decreases. And if the speed increases, then the angle increases. Whatever happens to the speed, the same thing happens to the angle. At least the same direction of change. The amount of change is not necessarily the same. But a decrease in speed means a decrease in angle. That is, the ray of light bends to get closer to the normal line. But then when it hits the other side, we would draw in another normal line. That is a line perpendicular to the surface at this point. 
So I guess something like this. That looks pretty close to perpendicular. At this point, the ray of light makes a new angle with this with this other normal line. And let me make that a different color. So we've got this ray, this angle that the ray of light makes with the new normal line. Now we're going from glass to air. That's from slow to fast. So now what's going to happen? Uh, so our angle will increase. Right. Instead of continuing straight through, the angle is going to bend, or the ray of light is going to bend to make the angle larger. And in fact, it's going to end up going through a certain location on the other side that we call the far the focal point. In fact, if you draw in, if you do this same sort of diagram for a variety of different rays, let's say you've got this ray coming in, it's going to bend to make the angle smaller and then bend again to make the angle bigger. But it's going to bend in such a way that it happens to go through the same focal point. Or if you draw an array down here that starts parallel, it's going to bend to change the angle and then bend to change the angle again in such a way that it happens to go through the same focal point. In fact, this is how we define the focal point. The focal point is the point that all of the previously parallel rays bend to intersect at. And this is why, for instance, you can use a lens of this shape as a burning glass to start a fire. If you have some kindling that you need to set on fire and you don't have a match, but you have a lens like this, you can take the incoming rays of sunlight, which are approximately parallel to each other, and use the lens to bend them all to hit one single location. So that tiny point is receiving all of the sunlight that this entire area would get. So it gets concentrated on that point, and that point gets really hot and can set things on fire. So that's one of many uses of a converging lens like this. We call it converging because these rays of light were originally parallel, but they bend to converge with each other at this one point. Any questions on that so far? Yeah, why does, um, so you said when we're like in the lens, the angle decreases, but then increases again? Uh, it's, it's all about the transition. If you're transitioning from air to glass, the speed is decreasing, so the angle gets smaller. If you're transitioning from glass to air, the speed increases, so the angle gets bigger again. So is the angle... Is the angle, like, outside of the glass, should that be the same because the medium is the same? Uh, it would be if the if the sides of the lens were parallel, but they're not parallel, so that changes things. Okay, so the greatest speed will be on the right side of the lens. Uh, well, the speed depends only on the medium. So on the left side, it's in air, so it's traveling at a certain speed. On the right side, it's light in air again, so it's back to traveling at the same speed. So overall, the speed hasn't changed. It just went through a period of time when it was going at a slower speed. OK. So that really, would be, Sorry, go ahead. The angle um, on both sides of the glass, would that be the same, or would that change? It's changed because of the geometry of what happens at the transition points. At the first transition, when we're going from air to glass, we change the angle. So we start at this angle and end at this smaller angle. But then when it hits the other side of the surface, the other surface of the lens, we have a different kind of transition. We start with this angle, which is influenced by the previous angle, but is not the same as the previous angle. So this new angle gets modified to a bigger angle, but that's not gonna be necessarily the same as the original angle. It's gonna depend on not only the Snell's law of refraction, but also on the geometry of how these surfaces are related to each other. Okay. So it's not just a matter of returning to what it started at. There were some other changes that happened in between, specifically the relationship between this slope versus this slope. Those are not, those two points on the surface are not exactly the same slope. So that means they interact with the light in slightly different ways.
Okay. Now, if the two walls had been parallel, like if, if our lens was shaped like uh, just a rectangle, let's say we just have a rectangular lens. In that case, if you've got any incoming ray of light, let's say, let make that narrower. Let's say you've got this incoming ray of light. That's going to hit the normal line, which will be uh, horizontal in this case. So it hits this normal line and bends. Since we're going from fast to slow, what's going to happen to the angle? Um, it would decrease. Yeah. So this is going to bend to make the angle smaller. And then we draw in another normal line on the other surface. But because the two, the two walls of the glass are parallel, the two normal lines will also be parallel. So if we take a look at the angles here, this is going to bend. Since we're going from slow to fast, what's going to happen to the angle? Um, the angle would then increase. Right. And if you take a look at these angles, let me actually zoom in on this. I think this is going to be easier if we see it a little larger. If you consider these angles, we've got, let's say we call this angle one and this angle two. So from angle one to angle two, the angle has gotten smaller. But if you compare that to, let's call this angle three, what do you notice about angle two and angle three? Are they, um, wait, which one's angle three? Uh, let me actually label these. If we call these angle one, angle two, angle three, and angle four. Uh, yeah, angles two and three are going to have to be the same. And this is ultimately a property of parallel lines. Because if you take a look at this normal line and this normal line, those normal lines are parallel because they're both parallel to the surfaces, which are also parallel. But then we also have a third line, the path of the light itself, which passes through both of them. And in general, if you've got any two parallel lines, and a third line that passes through both of them, that creates certain pairs of like, congruent angles. In this case, we've got angle two and angle three. Those are alternate interior angles to those parallel lines, so they have to be congruent. So from the geometry of parallel lines, we know these two angles, two and three, have to be congruent to each other. And that means that one shrinks to two because of Snell's law, but two and three are the same. So three grows to four because of Snell's law. And since the changes were symmetric, angle one and angle four will be the same. So if you take a look at the path of light here, light came in along this path, changes around inside the, the shape of the glass, leaves along this path. So the incoming path of light and the outgoing path of light, they're not exactly the same path. If you try to trace forward, it did get offset a bit. So the light is not traveling along exactly the same path that it was, but what do you notice about the original path and the final path? They're parallel to each other. Right, they're gonna be parallel. So if you've got a, a plate of glass that's perfectly parallel surfaces, like just a window pane, the light coming in at some angle gets deflected slightly, but then continues along the same direction, parallel to the original path. And the amount of deflection ends up being proportional to the thickness of the glass. So if you have a very thin piece of glass, there's hardly any change at all. The ray of light may as well just keep going in a straight line. The thicker the glass is, the more it gets deflected, but it's the final path will still be at least parallel to the original path. So yeah, angles one and four will be the same here. And that's ultimately because it's symmetric changes. One changes to two based on Snell's law, two and three are the same because of geometry, 
three changes to four because of Snell's law operating exactly in reverse. So two and three are the same as each other. One and four relate to two and three in the same way. So one and four also have to be the same. If the two plate, if the two surfaces of the glass plate are parallel. For the lens though, the two surfaces are not parallel to each other. We've got this surface and this surface. Those are not parallel, so that means that's not true in this case. The two angles are different, and the ray of light does change direction. The only exception would be if you've got a ray of light coming in towards the center, or at least coming in very close to the center. If you've got a ray of light coming in, we use a different color for this one, a ray of light coming in very close to the center. If you're talking about points very close to the center, those two surfaces may as well be straight up and down. So this is going to get deflected, but then continue along a path parallel to what it was originally. So any ray of light in any direction that's coming towards the exact center of the lens can be treated as almost continuing in a straight line. It does get deflected a bit, but if the lens is very thin, the deflection is almost nothing. So for a very thin lens, any ray of light coming in towards the center of the lens can be assumed to just keep going in a straight line. Whereas any ray of light that is coming in parallel to the central axis is going to ultimately bend towards the far focal point. But this also works in reverse. Any path of light is reversible. So if you have a ray of light that starts at a focal point, going towards the lens, it's going to bend to become parallel. So for a converging lens like this, we ultimately get three basic rules of how light behaves. Any ray of light that is collinear with a focal point, that is along the same line as a focal point, hits the lens and bends to become parallel. Any ray of light that starts parallel hits the lens and bends towards the far focal point far in the sense of on the other side of the lens. And also any ray of light coming in towards the exact center is just going to keep going in a straight line, no change at all. So those are usually called the three principal rays. In, uh, and of course, there can be many rays going in any direction. But the three principal rays are just the rays that are easiest to draw out. There's not really anything particularly physical special about them. They're just easiest to draw out on the diagram. So we usually start with those. Any other questions on how the converging lens works so far? Yeah, I have a question about like the third principal ray you drew mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, that one. So I'm confused about how um, like the, not, it's not reflected, but the ray that comes out of the glass is still mm -hmm. like on the same path and not, I guess like shifted. It does technically de get deflected. So it's going to be more like this. Uh, let me tidy up the other ones as well. So it does get deflected while it's in the glass. But the amount of deflection is proportional to the thickness of the lens. So if the lens is very thick, that's going to be noticeable. But if the lens is very thin, which is typically the kind of lens we're dealing with, then the deflection is very small. Like, let's say the lens is extremely narrow, like this. So the ray of light does get offset a little bit, but the offset is so small that it's hardly noticeable, and you may as well just treat it as going in a straight line with no change. Okay. Any other questions on the converging lens so far? Um. So I guess basically, if we wanted to draw rays through the converging lenses, um, like the most simplest would be to just draw the three principal rays. Exactly. And now that we have those three principal rays, the, the general, general rules for behavior of certain paths, we don't really need to consider what's going on inside the lens. You can always go back to the idea of refraction and figure out what's going on inside the lens. But it's often very convenient, at least for very thin lenses, to treat it as just a single, a single plane, to ignore what's going on inside and just say, we know this is a converging lens. So any ray of light that starts parallel is going to bend 
to become collinear with the far focal point. Or any ray of light that starts off collinear with the near focal point is going to bend to become parallel. Or any ray of light that starts off going straight through the center is just going to keep going. So those are three rays of light, three kinds of paths that are very predictable without even doing any calculations. You can just draw it out geometrically. And this makes it very easy. And this only works for converging lenses specifically. For diverging lenses, you'd use three different principal rays. But the idea is if you have a lens and you know the focal points, that is if you have any parallel rays coming in, you know where those are gonna to converge to. Uh, from either direction, which is why there's focal points on both sides. But if you have an object here, like let's say you just got some uh, candle or something, we generally treat the top of the object as emitting light. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is actually physically emitting light. Maybe it's just sitting there and light from something else, like light from the sun comes in and bounces off. But the important thing is the rays of light we care about are rays of light that can be treated as originating at the object. Even if they came from somewhere else and bounced off, they passed through the object or bounced off the object at some point. So we're just considering rays of light that, uh, that appear to come from the object. And we can say that the, the object is emitting light in all directions. But we only really need to care about the rays of light that are easy to draw the principal, easy to draw the ray tracings, specifically the three principal rays. And then we can say everything else will follow the same pattern. So to draw the three principal rays here, we know that we could draw, for instance, any ray of light from anywhere, but specifically from the object that is going straight towards the center. What's going to happen to that ray of light? Any ray of light straight towards the center is going to continue in what sort of way? Would it just reflect like on the same path or not reflect? I refracting, forget. But yeah, yeah, reflecting yep. means bouncing off. Refracting means going through possibly with a change. So this is going to pass through the lens because it's a lens, not a mirror. But because it's passing through the exact center, we would just assume that it continues along the same trajectory. There is a slight deflection and then continues parallel. But the deflection is almost nothing because we're talking about a very thin lens. So we can essentially just treat this as passing straight through with no further change. <clears throat> and then uh, what other ray from the object is going to be easy to draw here? If it leaves the object horizontally, then it re refracts through the far focal point. Yeah. And I would not necessarily say horizontally. In this case, it is horizontal. But you could have the lens oriented in any direction. So more generally, I would say a ray of light that starts off parallel to the central axis. Or you could also describe it as perpendicular to the lens. And yeah, that's going to hit the lens and bend towards the far focal point. So it starts off parallel and then becomes collinear with the far focal point. <laughs> collinear in the sense of along the same line as. And then what's a th we can actually see just from these two that they're going to intersect in this point. But to be sure, it's a good idea to draw in the third principal ray as well. From the object towards what? Um, it, it'll pass through the focal point. Yeah, specifically passing through the near focal point or collinear with the near focal point. And any ray of light that's collinear with the focal point is going to hit the lens and bend to become what? Uh, it'll be um like just horizontal yeah in this case horizontal or more generally parallel to the central axis and it looks like i haven't drawn this exactly accurately because these don't these should all intersect at one point let me tidy that up a little bit maybe yeah that looks about right but it looks like <clears throat> if we draw this very accurately the three principal rays that start off diverging, hit the lens, and then converge instead. They all come together at this one point. Which means the, the main upshot of all this is that these rays of light, of course, don't just stop here. They keep going. If you're standing on the other side, let's say you're standing somewhere beyond this point. 
then you're going to pick up, your eyes are going to pick up these three final rays of light. And not just three, but there's many more as well. For example, uh, this ray of light, even though it's not a principal ray and would be difficult to draw out, is going to bend in a similar way. And it's still going to intersect in the same point. And then like this ray of light is still going to bend in such a way that it still passes through that same point and keeps going. So if you're standing over on the other side here, your eyes are going to pick up all these rays of light. And as far as your eyes and brain can tell, where did these rays of light seem to come from? Um, the far focal point? They weren't all passing through the far focal point. That is, they weren't all passing through this point. Oh, that, like the intersection of all the yeah, rays. if you take a look at the intersection here, all of these final rays of light seem to have come from this point. They didn't originate in that point. But the thing is, your eyes and the part of your brain dealing with vision don't care about all this stuff that happened earlier. As far as your eyes and brain can tell, these rays of light all seem to have come from this point. So your brain just thinks, oh, that must be where the object was. That is, your brain sees or thinks it sees something here that seems to be emitting the light. And of course, there isn't anything there. That's just an empty point in space. But the rays of light that seem to be coming from that point are identical to the rays of light from the original object. So as far as your vision centers of your brain can tell, this upside down point here seems to be the object. It's not really the object, it's just where all the rays of light seem to be coming from. So we call that the image. The object is the point where the light actually is coming from. The image is the point where the final rays of light seem to be coming from. And since the rays of light actually did pass through that point, we would call it a virtual, or sorry, a real image. Image means the point where the final rays of light seem to be coming from. It's a real image because the rays of light really did all intersect at that point. Any questions on that image so far? No. Also, what can you say about the orientation of this, this image as compared to the original object? It is flipped. Yeah, it's flipped upside down. So if you're standing over here looking at the lens, what you will see is an upside down image of the original object. And also note that it appears to be smaller than the original object in the sense that it's less, less vertical height as well as being upside down. And in terms of the upside downness, I think you can see this by a lot more clearly by focusing on the individual rays. First of all, that it's below the axis, but also if you take a look at, let's say, let's say we color code these. This orange ray bends to go through the image point. Note that that was originally the ray that was coming in high up. Now it's a ray that's further down when it actually hits your eyes. As opposed to this ray was low down, but as it passes through the image, that's now high up when it hits your eyes. So the final image is going to seem to be upside down when you look at it. Any questions on that image so far? No. And a bit of terminology there. Uh, we measure all the distances here from the lens itself. So when we talk about, oh, the object distance, we're talking about how far is the object from the lens. When we talk about I, the image distance, we're talking about how far is the image from the lens. And when we say F, the focal length, we're talking about how far is the focal point from the lens. In either direction, it should be the same distance. So those will be O, the object distance, F, the focal length, and I, the image distance. And have you seen an equation describing how those are related? Yeah, is it like one over the distance of the object from the image plus one over something <laughs> equals one over the focal point distance? Yes. Yeah. Well, specifically, it's all these distances are measured from the lens, not from the object or from the image. So O is the distance of the object as measured from the lens itself. 
and then one over i. i is the image distance, the distance of the image as measured from the lens itself. And those have to add up to one over the focal length, as the distance of the focal point as measured from the lens itself. So the inverse is add up. One over object plus one over image equals one over focal point. And you can get this equation ultimately from similar triangles. If you draw out uh, this triangle and also this triangle, And the fact that these angles are the same because this ray of light to the, towards the center just goes straight through. If you set up some equations with these triangles, you can demonstrate that this equation is true. It ultimately comes from the geometry of those triangles. Uh, plus also another one through the focal point as well, because we're gonna need to incorporate F. But if you set up these triangles, you can use ideas of similar triangles to show that the, this is how these measurements are related. It ultimately comes from the geometry of the situation. Uh, so if you know any two of those in terms of actual measurements, you can find the third. Like for instance, let's say you know the focal length of the lens and you know where you're putting the object. You can calculate where the image will appear to be. Any other questions on that ray tracing or that equation so far? No. Then let's take a look at one more ray tracing as well. Uh, specifically, something interesting happens if we put the object closer to the lens. Let's say we're looking at situation D here, where the object is so close to the lens that it's inside the focal, list, focal length. That is closer to the lens than the focal point is. So we've got our object here, the point where the rays of light are coming from. And we wanna know where's the image. Uh, so again, we can draw in the same principal rays, starting with any, any ray of light starting from the top of the object. What would be one principal ray we can draw here? Um, we could draw one that leaves the object parallel to the axes and then refracts to the focal point. Yeah, if it starts off parallel to the central axis, it's going to bend towards the focal point on the other side. So that's one principal ray. Right? What's another one we can draw in? Uh, we can pass through the focal point and then reflect parallel to the- The problem is a ray of light from the object going towards the focal point on the same side never actually makes it to the lens. So could you draw it where like, like you dot the line to the left and then the actual ray would be like the yeah. continuation. Because it doesn't actually matter whether the ray of light really passes through the focal point. It just has to be collinear with the focal point in the sense of along the same line as the focal point. So here's a line that includes the focal point. If we have a ray of light that passes along that line, so this ray of light along that line, even though it never actually hit the focal point, this still counts as collinear with the focal point. And even though it doesn't necessarily hit the lens, maybe the lens is only this large and it stops there. Even if this ray of light doesn't physically hit the lens, geometrically, we can treat the lens as an infinite plane. So just imagine the lens keep going, keeps going up and down forever. A ray of light that hits the plane of the lens in this way is gonna bend. And since it was originally a ray of light collinear with the focal point, it's going to bend to become parallel to the central axis. And lastly, we can also draw from the object towards the center, and then what's going to happen? Uh, it's just going to continue on that path. Yeah, that one just keeps going. And do these rays of light intersect somewhere on the right side? No. So that means we don't get an image on the right side at all. But if you ignore what happened before the lens, your brain is just picking up these rays of light and your, your eyes are, and your brain gets the signal from your eyes and thinks, oh, these rays of light must have come from somewhere. 
And your brain just sort of instinctively backtraces and thinks this ray must have come from somewhere back here. This ray must have come from somewhere back here. This ray must have come from somewhere back here. And your brain interprets that as these rays of light must have all come from some single point. If the back traces don't actually end up in a single point, this is just gonna look kind of blurry. But your brain thinks these rays must have come from this point. And so your brain thinks the object must be at that point. Is the object actually at that point? No. No, the object was right here. But because the final rays of light seem to be coming from this point, we call that point the image. The image is just the point that all that the final rays of light seem to be coming from. But since they didn't, the rays of light didn't actually intersect there. We had to backtrace to find it. What kind of image do we call that? A virtual image. Yeah, this is a virtual image. Image in the sense that the rays of light seem to be coming from the final rays of light seem to be coming from that point but a virtual image because they didn't actually intersect there. You had to backtrace. How else would you describe that image as compared to the original object? It's a lot larger. Yeah, it's much larger. And note that that's because it's further away. If we draw out the uh, similar triangles, we've got a triangle of object distance and object height and a hypotenuse. And we've got another triangle of image distance and image height and hypotenuse. Those are similar triangles. They share the same angles, so they're going to be proportional. That is, the ratio of image height versus image distance matches the ratio of object height versus object distance. So the fact that the image is further away from the lens than the object is guarantees that the image will be also taller than the object is. Specifically, if the image is, let's say, three times as far from the lens as the object is, then the image will also appear to be three times as large. Uh, what about the orientation? How does the orientation of the image compare to the orientation of the object? Still, like it has the same orientation. Yeah, it has not been flipped. It's still right side up. So the converging lens, if the object is close to the converging lens, specifically closer than the focal point, creates a virtual image that's larger than the original object and same, same side up. So for this reason, a converging lens works well as a magnifying glass. Any typical magnifying glass, if you just got like a single lens that makes things look bigger when you hold it up to it, that's a converging lens. And it only works that way if you put the object close enough to it to be within the focal length. That'll create a virtual image that appears to be right side up and larger than the original object. Whereas if you hold up a magnifying glass to look at the other side of the room far away, you're going to get a real image. You're going to get a tiny upside down picture of the other side of the room. So this is why a magnifying glass, the way it's supposed to be used, only works for things that are already close up. Any other questions on that? Oh, no. So try out that same ray tracing procedure for all these other examples as well. It's, it gives you frameworks for several different locations of the object. Try out the same sort of ray tracing, figure out based on that object, uh, where does the image show up? Oh yeah, the signs. Uh, in this case, generally the signs for the object distance, <coughs> excuse me, the object distance O is always gonna be positive if it's an actual real physical object. There are some rare cases involving a multiple lens setup where one of the object lengths can be negative. So if you just got an actual physical object and one lens or mirror, O will always be positive. For I, the image distance, uh, it depends on which side of the lens you end up on. The way I usually think of it is the direction light's traveling at the end is the positive direction. Like in this case, we've got light traveling, it hits the lens and then goes in which direction at the end? What's the final direction of travel of light? Would you say overall the light after the lens is going to the left or to the right? Yeah, to the right. Overall, the light's traveling this way. Not necessarily the exact vector direction of any particular ray, but the overall trend is that light, is, light after the lens is traveling to the right. 
Whereas if there was were a mirror, the light would bounce off and be traveling to the left at the end. But regardless of whether you're talking about lenses or mirrors, the final direction of light is the positive direction, at least as far as the image is concerned. So if the image is on the side of the, of the direction light is traveling, then it's a positive value for I. In this case though, the virtual image is on the opposite side of the lens from the direction light is traveling at the end. So we would say that the virtual image has a negative value for I. That is to find the value for I here, you'd measure this distance, but treat it as a negative value because it's on the opposite side from the direction light is traveling. So in this case, and generally for virtual images, because it's on the dark side of the lens or dark side of the mirror, the image distance will be negative because we treat the direction light is traveling at the end as the positive direction. And then for F, if you're talking about a converging lens, if it makes light converge towards itself, then F will be positive. A diverging lens makes light spread further out and treats F as negative. Ultimately, the reason for that is that the thin lens equation is set up for converging lenses. It turns out it also works for diverging lenses, but only if you treat the focal length as negative. So for a diverging lens or mirror, F is negative. For a converging lens or mirror, F is positive. Any other questions on that? Did you also say for a diverging lens, the three principal rays are different? Uh, yeah, let's try one quick example of that just to see how that works. Uh, let's say this one. Some of them are gonna be, well, at least one of them is gonna be the same. If you have a ray of light from the object, uh, diverging is usually the same as convex in, or con, sorry, concave in shape. It doesn't have to be though. For a lens, it depends, the converging or diverging depends not only on the shape, but also the medium, the material it's made of and the material it's surrounded by. If you're assuming glass or plastic surrounded by air, that is a slow material surrounded by a fast material, then concave shape means diverging behavior and convex shape means converging behavior. But we generally describe lenses based on the behavior, converging or diverging, because it's not just about the shape. But you can always draw one ray through the center that keeps going in a straight line. That's always gonna be possible regardless of what type of lens it is. The other rays are kind of reversed. For a converging lens, if you draw a ray that starts off parallel, what's gonna to happen to it? Uh, would it go through the focal point for converging? Right, specifically it becomes collinear with the far focal point. For a diverging lens though, it's the reverse. Instead of becoming collinear with the far focal point, it becomes collinear with the near focal point. So drawing another sort of a framework line, a line that includes the near focal point and the point of intersection, your actual ray of light is gonna to bend to become collinear with that. Or you could think of it as bending away from the near focal point. So for converging, the, par the originally parallel ray bends to become collinear with the far focal point. For a diverging lens, the original parallel ray bends to become collinear with the near focal point. And then the third one is also kind of reversed. For converging, a ray of light that starts collinear with the near focal point bends to become parallel. For a diverging lens though, if you have a ray of light that starts off collinear with the far focal point, then it's gonna to bend to become parallel. That is, if you have a ray of light from the object that starts off heading towards the far focal point, collinear with the far focal point, it's gonna to bend to become parallel instead. So those would be the three rays for the, the three principal rays, the three rays that are easiest to draw for a diverging lens. One that starts towards the center and just keeps going. One that starts off parallel and bends to become collinear with the near focal point. And then one, one that starts off collinear with the far focal point, but bends to become parallel instead. And of course, since those don't intersect, what do we need to do to find the actual image? Oh, uh, we could, we would extend the rays back and find an intersection point. Yeah, back tracing to see where they seem to have come from. 
So the backtrace suggests we have a, a, a hypothetical intersection here where they seem to have come from. So that would be a virtual image. Since they didn't actually intersect there, they just seem to come from that point. So that would be a virtual image smaller than the original object and closer to the lens and right side up. So that's your, your three principal rays for a diverging lens, the three ray traces that are easiest to draw out. Uh, try that out with the other examples just to get an idea of what's going on and pay close attention to what happens to the image as you move the object around and how different locations of the object and different types of lenses lead to different behavior by the image. You wanna develop an intuition for this by, look, by looking for patterns. So you can look at things and say, well, this lens creates this type of image in this circumstance, so it has to be a converging lens. Or here's a diverging lens with an object here, I should expect it's gonna create this type of image. So look for patterns as you draw these out, try and develop an intuition for what types of situations lead to what types of images and why. So get some practice with that. Let me know if you have any other questions and I will see you next time. Thank you. I have like a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, okay, when we're like trying to remember like what three principal rays go to which lens, is that just memorization or is there like a better way to go about? Uh, you could always set it up with the with Snell's law and looking at what's going on inside the lens as well. Like actually draw out the lens and draw in the ray traces within the lens. The only problem is that takes a long time. So it's if you're if you want to do it in a hurry, it's better to just have the types of principal rays on instant recall. Okay. So definitely uh, try out the ray tracing, like draw out the shape of the lens, convex or concave, and actually draw out what the rays are doing. So you can get a, a conceptual idea why it behaves like this. But in terms of actually drawing it out, you wouldn't want to draw the interior behavior of the lens every single time. It just takes too long. So do it a few times to get an idea of why it works. But beyond that, it's a good idea to just memorize which types of rays or which, which rays behave in what ways with which lenses. Although okay. if you, just as a general trend, if for a converging lens, if you've got rays of light traveling and they hit a converging lens, they're gonna to bend to get closer together. If you've yeah. got a diverging lens, they're gonna to bend to get further apart. That's what we mean by converging and diverging in the first place. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. See you next time.